I'm Judy Hiramoto, and I live in San Francisco. I'm an artist, and um, I do a lot of um, artwork on politics, and um, I took a break from that, and now I'm doing um, landscape photography and um, work on ecology. Um, and I was teaching at Goddard College since um, January 2003 until um, July 2011, when I believe I was wrongfully terminated. I went to Antioch College, and Antioch College is an, a school that has individualized education, and it believes in social justice. Although at Antioch, there was social justice, so we never had to talk about it. We never used those terms. And I thought Goddard would be a similar situation with individualized education, and um, they talk about social justice and diversity, but in my experience, I haven't seen it there. So uh, you wanted to go there because you felt it had your, uh, your feelings or your principles as an institution. Absolutely. I thought we shared similar values. Um, I also liked it because I can live in San Francisco and um, you know, telecommute on this, um, with the students and visit the campus twice a year. So I thought that it had Antioch values, San Francisco values, and um, I thought Goddard's values were compatible with mine. So you went there, you started to teach there, and w what happened? I noticed that um, minority faculty were resigning or were revolved out, and I noticed that if students had the slightest altercation with minority faculty, then the minority faculty were blamed, and they were um, either fired or um, somehow pushed to leave. And I noticed that um, whatever kind of altercation um, the program director's cronies had, you know, I believe some of them were traumatizing students, some of them were really um, brutal with students. Um, How were they brutal with students? Oh, they would, they would um, harass them um, into doing things that they didn't want to do. And some of the students were so traumatized that they were doing art about the way some faculty had treated them. And um, my supervisor, the last supervisor, knew about this, and yet she did nothing about it. And I'm not talking about just minor misunderstandings the way I had with some students, but I'm talking about things that went on for one semester or two semesters. and. Um, the students were obviously unhappy. They obviously felt devalued by their advisors, the faculty members. And I think that this sort of education is not effective at all and um, is contrary to Goddard's values. And yet a lot of these people have been retained and all of them got full-time jobs. And but why would the administration of Goddard allow this if they wanted to encourage students and have a healthy atmosphere? <laughs> that is beyond me. I mean, that is a Zen koan because I can't figure it out. And some of these people um, who got full-time jobs committed plagiarism. And I mentioned that to the union twice. And the people who um, are retained are more interested in advancing themselves politically. And they do a lot of what I consider work that's not really... Um, in, you know, not really important to the school. Um, you know, they're out there promoting themselves, um, they're out there generating paperwork that isn't about progressive education, and yet they get the administration's attention and the administration thinks that they're actually doing something. And how much do they charge to go to Goddard? What is the cost to go to Goddard? Um, they charge the students about $6,500. Per semester. Per semester. Okay, so twelve thousand right. dollars. Twelve thousand. So you began to uh, raise some of these concerns and issues that you had at the university. I began to raise these concerns because I was getting negative evaluations, and they were not um, supportive. They were not helpful. They were simply trying to cut me down when I was doing my job, and they're talking about progressive education, but they're not asking what I can contribute, and what I was trying to do with this particular student. 
and students all have different needs. And um, the first negative evaluation came in 2006 when I had a student who was of Asian ancestry who was working with English as a second language and who was writing very, very short reports. Instead of the usual 20 pages, it was six pages. But I thought she had done her job and I enjoyed working with her. And so I wrote about this in my evaluation. And instead of supporting me by giving me some ideas as to how this, could, this dialogue could have been expanded, um, I was told that um, I wasn't working well with this student. Well, the odd thing is, two years later, the student worked with me again for her final portfolio. And she said that she wanted to work with someone who understood her. And because English was a second language for her, and I've been in a situation where Japanese or Spanish was my second language when I was visiting other countries, um, I understood that. And so we had telephone conversations. And we talked about different expectations in American educational systems and progressive schools as opposed to Asian education. And um, none of this was even brought up in the evaluation. So, you know, there's a, a double standard here where they're talking about individualized education, but they're not seeing that Asian faculty approach things in a different way. That still is a contribution to the program. And other faculty had similar problems, minority faculty. Right. What were some of the other issues? Well, it seems to me that they target um, Japanese and African Americans. And the two people who were fired um, didn't have a chance. One was fired after her first semester. And um, she was Japanese and African American and got into some situations with students where they were complaining about her. And so the administration took the student's side. And she was fired after one semester. And I talked to one of the students whom I had worked with before who was having some difficulty with her own work. And the student said that she had learned so much from this faculty member and that this faculty member had brought so much joy into the art making process. And I was just stunned because this faculty member was fired. So I said to the student, you need to go and tell the program director about this. And, um, the student said she would, but I just thought it was a terrible waste because the, uh, the faculty member had contributions that we could have really used. For example, she um, was a computer software programmer, and we could really use somebody like that. She was also an expert at Japanese tie dyeing and um, fabric design, and that's a unique quality as well. And she had lived all over the world. So I thought that would have expanded and um, enlarged and reached out to a range of students who could really benefit from her skills. And then the second person who was fired was African American. And um, he commented um, that a student's work was racist. And what she was doing was um, going to a New York park and picking up black men and somehow involving them in her art project. But it was only black men. And so that was a huge altercation um, because he and another um, African American and I were the first minorities to be hired there. I knew there was going to be some kind of issue. And I know his work. I read some of his reports that students voluntarily shared with me. And I thought they were fine. And after a year, he disappeared. And so these people were terminated after one semester or one year. And then nobody since then had been fired um, except for me. And I had been there um, nine years. So you know, there's a lot of politics going on there. And, um, Currently, we only have three minority faculty. Um, Twelve worked there altogether at one point or another, and all were fired or resigned. And only four white faculty 
um, are no longer there, and they all resigned. So no white faculty were fired, as far as I know. So the, why don't you talk, this is a union, right. UAW, and how, when did you first learn that it was union? Uh, there was a, another union when I first started teaching there, and then we weren't satisfied with the union, and so we thought UAW would be better for us. So within a year or two, UAW became our union. And that brought on even more problems because the union raised our pay from 12000 a year to about um, 28000 a year. And we're doing more work, so it's not all a pay raise. Um, but the union also promised full-time jobs. And that's where all these um, unethical people started coming because they saw that they could possibly get a full-time job. And that's what they were interested in, uh, making as much money as possible, doing as little work as possible. I believe they were jipping the faculty, and they were jipping the school, and they were jipping the students, most of all, and themselves. But somehow, everybody who um, did or wrote anything negative about me all eventually got full-time jobs from 2008 through 2011. And those were the only three full-time jobs that I've seen come up in our program since 2003. So there was retaliation against you and, and favoritism towards those people who complained about you or uh, supported getting rid of you. Absolutely. And um, these people all have a certain kind of set pedagogy. They believe in um, teaching in an individualized way. I think what they're doing to the students are really harmful. For example, the program director wrote in her um, response to students, uh, she was talking about her Armenian background, and she said that she had learned from her grandfather that um, the Turks had decimated the Armenians. And she wrote to the student and said, after that, I wanted to kill every Turk I met. Now, what kind of transformative, <laughs> what kind of transformative, um, response is that. And it ends there. It didn't have to end there. She could have said, well, I got to meet a Turkish person and realize that um, it wasn't individual Turks, that it was the government's policy. She could have said something like that. But no, it just ends there. And I was just appalled. So there's racism in um, the way they respond to people. Um, and there's racism in the way they treat minority faculty. And you began to be, uh, action was taken against you, bad uh, evaluations, mm -hmm. and, and they were basically trying to set you up. Yeah, they be fired. Right. And so in addition to the 2006 um, bad evaluation, um, well, which was adjudicated in my favor because I finally got rid of the negative evaluations, and minority faculty did my evaluation. And they wrote me rave evaluations. And the dean um, rewrote hers so that it was um, more supportive and not all negative. So that, was, that worked out OK, um, because the academic dean was very supportive. Um, and she said at the time that evaluations were supposed to be supportive and not judgmental. And she pointed out all the sleazy things that were done in my evaluation. For example, stacking the members up so that they were going to write negative things about me. And then after 2006, in 2009, um, the former program director resigned. And then there were two new program directors. And um, these program directors um, were giving me advice. And I would take them. And then they would write about it and say I had done the wrong thing. And over a period of three semesters, I had some minor misunderstandings with students that were clarified promptly and amicably. And I bear no malice to the students. And I'm sure they're, they would be surprised if they knew that something they had said or done you know, was getting me in trouble. Um, but they the two program directors said that I was um, to submit every single report 
that I wrote to students to them before I sent it to the students. And then they were going to cap my student load from 10 students to seven, which is the bare minimum in the contract. And um, I went to the personnel director and I asked her to mediate this. She did nothing for three weeks and I was forced to file a grievance before the 30 days were up. And the union was supportive. And so um, about six weeks later, we got together with another academic dean and she adjudicated the case in my favor. She said that I had resolved um, issues amicably amicably and promptly and um, that I had responded to the students in a professional manner um, and that I should get the student load that I had before this case had begun. So that would be 10 students. But um, the two program directors capped it at first nine and then they capped it at eight until I was fired. Um, and so they had that grievance. And the union said to me, you know, you can't just write about the case. You have to really hit hard at them. So I said, OK. And I wrote that these two program directors were litigation risks. And those were prophetic words. I also wrote that they were using valuable faculty meeting time, I mean, eight hours of faculty meeting time, to do some self-therapy session where they were talking about how they wanted to become permanent program directors rather than interim program directors. And then they were bad-mouthing members of the administration and saying who, evaluating who in the administration wanted power, who was going to try to keep them from becoming full-time faculty. And I happened to talk to one of the administrators, and it seemed to me that they were going to conduct an open search within the program. So I went back and told the faculty that. Um, and my role with the faculty was to remind them that we need to be reality-based. You know, we can't be projecting negative things on the administration and negative things on other people without really knowing what's the reality of this. And I also reminded faculty um, about how these new or how these interim um, program directors' jobs um, had been framed, that they were interim and that eventually there would be a search. And someone even suggested that we rotate in terms of program directors. Um, but once these two people got in power, they seemed to forget everything that wasn't in their um, favor. And so I think they um, felt threatened that I knew too much and that I had been there longer than they had and I had um, a history a history of the school you know before it got to be so unethical. And so then what happened? Okay, so then um, the union and the um, college administration, um, put together an SLA, a side letter agreement, that radically changed how um, eight and nine year evaluations for faculty would be conducted. And the SLA allows faculty to be terminated in mid-contract uh, with no just cause. And my attorney pointed out that this SLA was illegal because it had not been ratified by the faculty. The union keeps insisting that it was ratified because when we ratified the three-year contract in 2009, there was a clause that said that the faculty agree that there will be a committee to propose new evaluation procedures. But what those procedures were, it didn't say. And then in um, 2011, um, in April, on April 5th, the president of the college, Barbara Vacar, and the um, union faculty representative scrambled together and signed this new agreement. And there was no time for ratification because we received notice that there was going to be a new evaluation procedure on April 25th. And then 
those of us who are up for evaluation were told to turn in our evaluations on May 1st. And the guidelines, the actual guidelines for the evaluation came to us on May 5th. And UAW's constitution, um, Article 19, Section 3, clearly states that no faculty representative, no union representative can make agreements with the employer without the members ratifying that agreement. It says so on their website, and yet they're insisting that because of that clause saying we agreed that a committee should propose new proposals um, for faculty evaluations, we had ratified this new evaluation. So the fallout on me was that I had finished two years of my three-year contract, and there was a very unethical evaluation process, um, and I was terminated. And I wasn't even allowed to um, contest the termination, as both the SLA and the old contract state. And what reason did they give that you could not contest the termination? They didn't give any reason. Um, my lawyer and I wrote two appeals, and then um, after 10, or, I'm sorry, after seven months, we, um, the union finally got it together and had a step two grievance meeting where they presented my case. And according to the collective bargaining agreement, the um, chief academic officer, the vice president, Mary Ann Reef, is supposed to respond. Well, that was on February 15th, and she had two weeks to respond. I still haven't received a response. The only response I received was an inappropriate settlement saying, here, you know, we're going to buy you out. There were no negotiations about the settlement I, that I was involved in. I have no idea what communication the union had with the college in these 10 months that this case has gone on. And the union never cited a single collective bargaining violation, even in its brief after the um, second, uh, after the step two meeting. And you, these union officials, UAW, who were you dealing with with UAW? Well, I was dealing with um, Francis Sherritt, and he was the faculty representative. And I was dealing with Ron Patnode, who, was, um, who is the president of UAW Local 2322 in Mount Holyoke, Massachusetts. And I was dealing with Eva Swidler, who's a faculty representative. And I called them immediately after I was terminated, and they told me to resign. They told you yeah. to resign? Yeah, they told me to resign. I, had, I wasted five days of the 10 days I had to write my first appeal. And after I wasted five days, they sent me an email and they told me to resign. On what basis should you resign? What did, they didn't, why did they say you should resign? They, should just, they just said you should resign? Yeah. They, they said nobody's going to overturn this in the administration and you should resign. And I said, well, can't you help me? What collective bargaining agreements can I cite? Um, what are the Vermont laws that I can cite? Nobody gave me any help at all. All they did was send me posters that um, every Vermont employer is supposed to have in their workplace. Um, you know, and so I wrote my first appeal, and um, the vice president did not respond. The president responded, and she said she upholds the decision of the program director, Jackie Hayes. No reason was given. Who was the president? Barbara Vacar. Okay. And she's been there for about two years now. And um, my lawyer wrote the second appeal, and he wrote to the president, and she's supposed to respond. And these are all collective bargaining agreements. And instead of responding, she said, um, oh, she didn't even respond. She had the chief academic officer, Faith Brown, respond. And Faith Brown said, we're not responding. That's it. So I still don't know what. Um, I did that annoyed the administration because the president had selected one of my students' final portfolios um, two summers ago, and 
selected three out of 20 and said that these three were the finest she had read. Yeah, so I'm just totally baffled. I didn't think I had an um, antagonistic relationship with the administration, but thanks to Jackie Hayes, the program director, I do now. And you began to try to get the union to follow the union rules, the union procedures, the contract. Right. And they, they did not want to. What, what did they say to you when you asked them, why don't you follow the union procedure, follow the union contract, and follow our rights? Well, I had to get my lawyer to write to the union. And so instead of fighting the union, um, instead of fighting the college, I'm fighting the union. And um, my lawyer um, said that there's a conflict of interest because the union promotes the SLA and made that agreement without ratification. And so there is no way that they can put up a vigorous defense in my case. And the union has a clause that says only the union can take this case to arbitration. And um, so since lawsuits are very costly, and I thought they'd be even more time consuming, I thought, OK, I'll work with the union and have my lawyer advise me. But that didn't work so well because um, the union refused to talk to the lawyer. And so I was talking to a hostile agent. And as a result, I had to be really careful about what I said or wrote. And I was constantly consulting with my lawyer. And even that didn't help because the result of all this was um, I didn't get any response from the college. And it just ended up in a settlement that I refused. And you brought to the attention of the union. Did you go to the leader, national leadership of the union and say that there were changes in your contract that were improper, that that hadn't been approved by the membership? Absolutely. I went to Bob King. I wrote to him, um, and he's a president of UAW, um, the international UAW, in Detroit. And I told him that I thought this was unethical, and I thought that the union um, had breached its fiduciary duty to me. And so he had Karen Rosen Rosenberg, an international representative, um, represent me and look into the legality of the SLA. Well, she took about five weeks to do this, and her conclusion was the same. The SLA was valid, but she didn't say why. So it went on and on and on like this, and I never got answers from the union. The union um, didn't really investigate my case until Halloween. So I was fired in July, and they started investigating on October 31st, and it took them um, about three months. And once they saw what had gone on, they were horrified. I mean, they told me that they didn't investigate the case because they read my supervisor's report about me, and they thought I was a disaster. Because she had written a nine-page, single-space report that was so malicious that even investigative lawyers at the NLRB can see that there was a lot of malice and animosity. And it was misquotes, and it was taking petty incidents and blowing them up. And um, you know, she didn't have a thing on me, because I knew I worked in a hostile situation, and I was really, really careful. And um, she didn't acknowledge all the contributions to the program I had made. You know, and so every small thing, even if it wasn't something I had to do, um, you know, she would bring up as something that all faculty had to do. And I was doing those things, like attending optional programs at residencies. You know, there are people who don't attend any programs, and yet they have been renewed. And so, you know, that's a non-issue as far as I'm concerned. And then, um, then they realized that what I told them that one of the committee members had said that after they had written positive evaluations about me, Jackie Hayes got them all on a conference phone call and gave them information, and I still have no idea what she told them. But then most of them changed their evaluations and wrote negative things. And there was one person who wrote in her evaluation, I recommend that Judy's contract be renewed. I didn't even get that until the grievance until the union asked the college for documents. Now, if one person writes that, then 
there's supposed to be an investigation, and I'm supposed to have a year to submit another report. And there was a year left of my contract anyway. So the union was horrified, and they did write um, a good argument on why the evaluation procedures were unfair. But after going on and on and on for 14 pages, um, the end of Karen Rosenberg's brief was no CBA violations were cited, and she didn't ask for any remedy. So she's basically saying, OK, we know the evaluation was unfair, so you give her what you want. And that's what got me really angry. And so in addition to filing um, a complaint about the college to National Labor Relations Board on retaliation, I filed a complaint to the National Re Labor Relations Board on um, the union's breach of fiduciary duty. And while I'm filing this, all the officials at NLRB are saying, you know, we encourage you to file this complaint about the union, but it's not going to go anywhere. So they're saying this to me before they investigate. <laughs> and I called the Department of Labor and talked to them about this, um, because on their website they have a definition for extortion. <laughs> and that definition for extortion is anybody who tries to do physical or financial harm to a union member. Um, and, it, and extortion is also any situation where the grievance process is not fair and just. And I thought, wow, that's me. That's my situation. So I called the DOL and they said, no, no, you got to go to the NLRB. And I told them what the NLRB had told me, that I'm not going to get anywhere with my complaint against the union. And they said, well, they shouldn't tell you that. <laughs> so I'm caught in this horrible situation. I feel like I'm a sick patient at an HMO, and I know the doctor's crooked, and the doctor's going to operate on me, and I need this operation badly, but I'm spending all my time fighting the HMO to get a better doctor. You know, and that's the situation I find myself in. So I find myself targeted twice, once by the school and once by the people who are supposed to represent me. That doesn't say very good things about the UAW, that they would leave you in the lurch like this and to other workers there, other faculty. Well, um, I did a Google search and I typed in UAW plus corruption and I got a ton of articles. I mean, one website alleges that um, UAW um, takes in 230, $230 million dollars and they spend a nickel on each member. And I also have their financial report. And Karen Br Rosenberg, who's representing me, makes about $120,000 a year. And my salary at Goddard College was less than a clerk typist in Detroit, who makes $34,000 a year. So all the money that we pay in union dues are not going to union lawyers to help us out. Um, they are not going to arbitration fees. They're not going to pay the arbitrator to do um, her job as they promised me. Um, all these fees are going into paying um, salaries of UAW officials and some multi-million dollar golf course that they have in Detroit. You know, so this union has a lot of money, but there's no trickle down. And I'm very, very disappointed because all of us were happy to pay union dues. I joined the union even when it was an open shop. Now it's a closed shop. And I thought this was legal insurance in case we get fired. But it turns out to be a horrible trap. And um, at the moment, I feel like Jodie Foster in that movie, Silence of the Lambs, where there's this really scary basement scene where <laughs> Hannibal Lecter, the sociopath, is chasing after her, and he has night vision glasses. The basement is pitch dark, and Jodie Foster's a law enforcement official trying to find her way around that basement. And 
I keep hitting the walls of Hannibal Lecter's basement because I don't know what kind of game they're playing. But I think I figured it out. And I think it's a zero-sum game that the union's playing. And I've spent a lot of legal fees and a lot of time and a lot of energy fighting the union while the college has done nothing to have to defend itself. And what, what do you want in justice, in the way of justice? What would you like to see? Well, I think the college um, needs to respond to all the complaints that I have filed, as well as my attorney. And um, I think they should, um, I think the ideal remedy would have been um, back pay and reinstatement. And that would have mitigated costs. But it doesn't seem to me that the college is interested in reinstatement at all. And so in that case, I think they owe me front pay and back pay and legal fees. And your job back. And <laughs> my job back. I don't think they want me back. <laughs> I, think, I think that's the biggest weapon I have, that if I go to NLRB and the adjudicator there says that I deserve my job back, I think that would scare them the most because um, they obviously don't want me You, you know too back. much? I know too much now, and there's also too much water under the bridge. I know even more now than I did before. And I believe the whole um, justice system is corrupt. And this flies in the face of what Goddard College believes in. The uh, president of Akar said that Goddard College's values include diversity and social justice. And this is a horrible breach of social justice. I don't see how they could um, justify this in any way if they have to go to any kind of um, fair and just arbitration or court situation. And people, I guess, could write to the Board of Trustees. Does the Board know about it, of, of Goddard College, what's going on? I wrote to the Board of Trustees, and I was told by the union that um, this was improper, um, but they do have my letter. I suppose other people could write to the Board of Trustees. You know, there's a website with their contact information. Um, so the Board of Trustees definitely knows about it, and I'd like them to know that they're liable too. I mean, I would not serve on the Board of Trustees unless Goddard paid for liability insurance because there's so many things going on. Um, well, as a so-called progressive educational institution, why would they retaliate against minority faculty? I mean, it seems like incongruous. It seems like in contradiction mm -hmm. to what they're saying, that they want a diverse faculty and mm -hmm. they want different experiences, different you know, cultural experiences and mm -hmm. historical experience. Why, why punish people who are bringing those to the college? Right. Well, also, it's in the collective bargaining agreement that they won't retaliate and they won't discriminate. Um, and I think um, one of the best responses I've seen to this is um, an article by Sumi Cho, and she's an academic um, professor and lawyer, and um, she wrote a wonderful essay on um, Asian American faculty women, and she talked about how the stereotypes fly around and nobody bothers to investigate because everybody thinks that, you know, these Asian uh, faculty women are guilty. And the horrible thing about it is that they expect us to put up and shut up. But I live in the Bay Area, and there's so many wonderful examples of people who have fought cases. Unfortunately, they're all minorities. Everybody who hired a lawyer won. I don't know of anybody who won through the union. And um, so I think um, that's one of the big things going on, um, you know, where there's a lot of stereotypes. And if I look very, very carefully in my evaluation, these stereotypes are there. For example, one faculty person who wrote a pretty supportive um, evaluation said, well, I don't see how, 
You know, you could go to a progressive school and work hard and be so diligent. That seems to fly in the face of our program. And I thought, what? You're saying that people in the program aren't diligent and aren't hard workers? And then you're also saying that Japanese Americans are diligent, but not progressive and not creative. And, and I think also um, that stereotype that Japanese Americans are quiet prevails because two people wrote that in my evaluation. And as you know, I'm not quiet. They did try to shut me up at meetings by not responding and by looking at me you know, with glazed eyes. But I would persistently um, and diplomatically bring up points that I thought were important. So I think they're going to expect me to go away, but I'm not going to go away, you know. And they've had every opportunity to address this. I even wrote a personal letter to the president, um, even before my lawyer or the union could tell me not to do this. And I said, look, I'll talk with you without my lawyer and without my union, you know. And I said, you know, because you're of Jewish ancestry, I would think that you would understand um, how stereotypes um, are ingrained and how certain ethnic groups don't receive social justice. And um, I've seen that you write essays about this and present them. Um, so I would like to have a discussion with you about why I'm being fired. And even that didn't work. So she just didn't respond and someone else wrote and said that um, the president was unable to respond to my letter. So I've tried everything and um, you know I know myself that if everything I've done isn't going to work then I'm going to try you know um, other means like talking to the media and I think Goddard's very foolish because I think they have a great program um, but I don't think people would want to go there if this is the kind of thing that they're doing where they're talking about social justice but not walking the walk. And, you know, one of my own students was horrified that this was going on and she said, you know, if that's the kind of school it is, I don't want to go there. And I said, no, no, you know, it's the program's fine for you. Just keep doing it and you'll be okay. But um, I know enrollment's gone down and I know there are some discontented students posting things on the website. You know, so eventually word will get out and Goddard will get what it deserves. So it's rather short-sighted for them to behave this way. I think it's extremely short-sighted because Goddard has such a venerable reputation. It's over a hundred years old. It's always been at the forefront of progressive education. And I wanted to work at this place even for $12,000 a year. And the um, art organization that posts these jobs took it upon themselves to post it as an internship because the pay was so low. But I knew that I'd be learning a lot, and I certainly did. I don't regret the amount of work I put in there. I met wonderful students. Um, they fed me, um, introduced me to new books and new artists, just as I have with them. And so um, I think it's extremely short-sighted, and I think Goddard um, really needs to expand its um, diversity so that it can provide students with a more multifaceted education than the Wonder Bread kind of advising that goes on now. Okay, well, thank you. Well, thank you, Steve. <laughs> Well, maybe after they see this tape, they'll negotiate. <laughs> do they get that tape off the video? You know? They'll do anything. <laughs> this is what you have to do with these people. You know? it's, it's like, you know, they're, they're so in their world. Well, you know the thing I hate about academia? Turn this off. Here. <laughs> before I say some really awful things. No, that's okay. You're very, you're very good to them. You know, I mean, you just told the truth about it. Yeah, that's, what a story. Yeah. yeah. But you know the thing I hate about academia? And lawyers. It's about how UAW wants to recruit um, workers in academia 
And I'd like to tell all the academics out there that UAW is not the right union for you. You might want to try American Association of University Professors because they have a fairer grievance process where they believe that you should be represented by counsel of your choice. Also, in my experience, Karen Rosenberg, the UAW representative who's supposed to be presenting or supporting me in, and um, presenting this case to Goddard, said to me that she doesn't deal very much with academic cases. And it seemed to me that she had a hard time grasping what was going on um, and the complexity of this case because there's a lot of documents, there's a lot of um, faculty jargon, and I didn't think that um, Karen Rosenberg or Ron Patnode of the UAW Local um, 2322 have any idea what we do at Goddard. It's a very complex kind of situation and it really requires um, advocacy um, that's intellectually nimble, that is willing to read documents, and that is um, willing to do some research on what the academic environment entails. For example, um, the university or the college, Goddard College, is not giving us documents that the union requests because they're citing FERPA, which is a privacy act um, that protects students. And what we're asking is not personal, personal um, information, but simply um, information on who they requested as advisors. Because I'm being told that um, not many people want me in it as an advisor, and I don't believe that's true. And the college's um, documents contradict what the program director said. And they're not giving this to us, citing FERPA. And Karen Rosenberg didn't even know what FERPA was. And I had to send her a couple of links to websites so that she could do this research. And so I'm doing the research for the union, and yet I'm not getting paid for this.